So mast cells are a type of blood cell found as part of our immune system. They're located in all our body tissues, but especially in the areas of the body that are going to be exposed to the outer environment. Uh, we're thinking skin, uh, the epithelium of the lungs, and the entirety of the GI tract. They play an integral role in identifying potential pathogens, any uh, tissue injury, uh, allergens, and they kind of play the role of police officer. So they blow the whistle and say, hey, there's something that needs to be addressed here. So they're one of the first pieces of our immune system that are going to be responding to these potential issues that we're seeing. Normally in a, in a healthy person, this system is well controlled. Um, but in MCAS patients, we can see a situation where these mast cells are continually activated and they're either never turning off or never decreasing the amount of these chemical mediators that they're going to release that are going to signal the body that there is an issue that needs addressing. These chemical mediators most notably are going to be histamine, something that we know is very tied to allergic reactions and general allergies, itchy eyes, runny nose, all of that. But then we'll also see a lot of leukotriene activity um, and uh, tryptase, which we'll actually discuss a little bit more specifically because that's a lab that can actually be drawn. So the reason I want to spend so much time discussing an in-depth uh, discussion on the uh, diagnostic criteria for MCAS is that it's a really common story that I've, I've heard in my personal interactions with patients, but then also as I do my research and peruse like a lot of the the blogs and patient support groups, um, it seems like this is a very common story from patients that are eventually diagnosed with MCAS. But oftentimes their initial symptoms will be described as psychosomatic. So clinicians will say, hey, are you sure this isn't all in your head? Even though we have um, measurable symptoms and, and labs that we can draw that are tied to histamine release. So I wanted to really dig into all of the available data in terms of establishing a clear-cut diagnosis or at least high suspicion that MCAS or mast cells could be involved in a lot of these symptoms that we're experiencing. So the, the diagnostic criteria, we're actually going to include this as a link. Uh, there's a good study that kind of walks through all of this, but it does it in the very broad scientific term, so we're going to narrow it down a little bit. Um, so the first one is it is going to require uh, involvement of two of four primary organ systems. So the first one, as is, is kind of expected with histamine, is going to be cutaneous symptoms or symptoms affecting the skin. So this histamine release is going to cause a lot of increased blood flow. It can cause flushing, especially in the face. So if you think of someone that has like a red face that is um, terribly burning, uh, that could be a sign of involvement for MCAS. Um, we can also see pruritus or just itching that is completely resistant to either treatment or like when you scratch it, it just never goes away. Patients that have experienced pruritus know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not a mosquito bite. It's a little bit deeper than that. Uh, we can also see hives, especially if they're uh, kind of spread head to toe. It's not like a patch of skin that is experiencing hives. It's total systemic exposure. And then angioedema, which would be more associated with like severe allergic response, so swelling in the, in the lips area. Uh, the next organ system that we're going to be talking about is respiratory effects. So we talked about mast cells being involved in that uh, pulmonary epithelium. So we can see edema in that area that's going to cause shortness of breath, uh, hypoxia or lack of oxygen getting in the system. And then we can even see uh, laryngeal edema, so swelling of the throat. Uh, included in this would also be some of our more classic allergy symptoms, so like runny nose, itchy eyes, um, susceptibility to getting that nasal congestion that can lead to sinus infections. Those would all be signs that the pulmonary system is being affected. So that's, that's system number two. Um, system number three is gastrointestinal. So we also talked about the GI epithelium having a lot of mast cell activity. Uh, so these mucosal mast cells are highly expressed throughout the GI tract, especially the small and large intestines. And then this inappropriate histamine release can cause just a lot of disparate GI symptoms. Most notably, diarrhea is a lot more common with this, but you can also see severe nausea leading to vomiting um, and abdominal cramping as well. So that is number three. Number four would be cardiovascular. So histamine causes a lot of vasodilation. And the analogy I've used for years to talk about 
why blood pressure drops with vasodilation. So imagine you get a garden hose and you're pushing water through it. And then we found a way to make the hose bigger, but the water flow hasn't changed. Now the pressure that is holding those walls open is going to decrease suddenly. And when that is occurring, especially widespread throughout the, throughout the cardiovascular system, patients will experience a lot of, um, postural hypotension. So as they stand up, their blood vessels reflexes to tighten up. So we're maintaining blood flow to the brain is impaired. So they'll find a lot of dizziness as they change body positions. Um, we can see syncope or fainting. Uh, so that would be involvement in the cardiovascular system. So current diagnosis requires two of these four body systems to be involved. I know we've talked before in the previous video about all the other potential signs and symptoms. So we can see a lot of CNS symptoms. So fatigue, especially chronic fatigue, um, as well as brain fog. So all of these other symptoms would, might be suggestive of mast cell activation being a role, but would not be reaching those criteria points. So the next subject I want to cover are the labs that we can use uh, to identify uh, the clinical picture of MCAS. I mentioned briefly in the first video that these labs can be a little bit difficult because they are either difficult to gather the samples needed for it or we have issues with um, the timing thereof and when it's drawn is in relation to when the MCAS event occurred or exacerbation. So the first one I want to cover is consider the gold standard for identifying MCAS or histamine issues related to mast cells. So it's called serum tryptase. Uh, tryptase is a protein that is going to be released from mast cells as they degranulate in response to one of those triggering events. Um, what is tough with this one is the timing can be very crucial. So when we have an MCAS exacerbation, we see a lot of mast cells degranulating, releasing histamine, leukotrienes, and this tryptase. It is going to peak within an hour in the blood and then really die off after four hours or so. So when we have an exacerbation, that is the best time to draw to really draw this uh, clinical conclusion. Uh, and then that would be compared to baseline. If baseline tryptase levels aren't available, the best way to do this is after that triggering event, when you get your labs drawn, come back again within 24 to 48 hours typically and get another draw when things have calmed down. And if you see a sharp increase in that tryptase level, that would be indicative that mast cells are involved in what's going on. Another really common test that people will do is a uh, methylhistamine, uh, which is actually expressed in the urine. The best way to do this is actually to collect urine over 24 hours and then bring it to the lab and then they'll assess that number for you. The reason we see this used less often is there's a lot of gray area with it. So our diet can actually affect the results of this, how everything is stored. Uh, so depending on where you're keeping all that urine as you're gathering it uh, can actually influence the, the histamine results. Um, and again, the diet, the, the food we eat can actually be histamine rich foods. We'll, touch on that in video number three when we talk about treatment and other modalities for reducing histamine burden. But then also the urinary tract, the microbiome in there is actually going to influence histamine. So we see this one used less often, but if someone is getting a tryptase level drawn and they want more information, this is another option out there. And then the third lab I wanted to discuss, and this one we see even less so, it's uh, looking at prostaglandins in the urine. Uh, this isn't a collect for 24 hours, but it does have really specific refrigeration requirements. So I, my understanding is a lot of labs aren't equipped to handle this or be confident about the result they can pull from this. But the reason I included in this assessment is that if someone is having a lot of hypotensive episodes, so that the histamine release is causing that vasodilation, which is causing their... Um, blood pressure to drop, especially with changes in body position, this test could be a really good way to tease out whether it's a histamine release issue or other things related to the heart. So another option is that prostaglandin uh, urine measurement. Another lab that can be drawn is uh, they can actually do biopsies. So anywhere that the body has mast cells, they can draw it from, or like pull a biopsy from the skin. They could do the GI epithelium while they're doing a colonoscopy or something like that. And they can actually uh, pull it from the bone marrow and 
pathologists can look at the histology or how, how those mast cells are looking, their density in relation to other cells, and draw a lot of conclusions with that. Um, this would be considered a, a great way to diagnose something called mastocytosis, which isn't something we'll get super into detail on this, but it's related to mast cell activation um, and can really influence a lot of more body organ systems. It's a rare disease, but can affect the bone marrow. Um, so we'll touch a little bit on that as we talk about genetics next. That's a good transition to our discussion of genetic factors that can be influencing someone's susceptibility to mast cell activation or likelihood of issues with mast cells. So the mastocytosis, again, severe disease, um, different progression, um, but also related to mast cells, so I want to cover it here. That would be tied to a mutation on the receptor tyrosine kinase gene that is going to be influencing how mast cells behave. And if that mutation has occurred, you can see aggregations of mast cells that are affecting organ systems a little bit more severely. So we think about liver function, it can actually affect the bone marrow and uh, uh, proceed to leukemia. Again, this would be tied to a very specific mutation, but we do know through that that mast cells are influenced by mutations, especially that specific one on the tyrosine kinase gene. The next gene that I want to discuss is a little bit more widespread. It's actually believed that up to 6% of the population has a mutation on this gene. So it's the uh, alpha tryptase gene. Uh, this one actually has a diagnosis for patients that have that. It's called hereditary alpha tryptosemia, or HAT is what they call it. So you can have multiple copies of the same alpha tryptase gene on a single chromosome. And the burden of this tryptase release is going to be actually tied to how many of those mutated chromosomes you have. So you could have um, four normal types or you could have four abnormal types. If someone has all four, they're likely going to have a lot higher level of baseline tryptase, which is in turn going to influence their ability to kind of shoulder the burden of allergens coming in and their likelihood of having MCAS develop as a clinical presentation. So these aren't the only genes involved, but they're certainly the ones that are being looked and researched on more specifically right now. But we can also view a lot of methylation on gene sites that are associated with this in patients suffering from MCAS. So we know that there's this epigenetic component, which would really explain why some people might have two mutant alpha tryptase genes, but not really have allergies or anything that they need to worry about, even though they're part of that 6% of the population. And then someone else might have the same exact genetic makeup and have a lot of issues or MCAS related uh, syndromes. It's worth noting that right now there isn't a specific genetic test that'll say, hey, you are likely to have MCAS or not. But Looking at these specific genes gives us a really good avenue for future research, especially in population studies. Some other factors that might be considered a triggering situation for either an MCAS exacerbation or someone that was kind of all set up genetically to have this or even not, and suddenly it's occurring later in life, is uh, bacterial infections, viral infections, uh, tissue injury, uh, stressful events. So like you could even have someone that had like a traumatic injury followed by a surgery, uh, followed by an infection, and we've kind of set the body up for having this MCAS infection or MCAS syndrome. Uh, the other thing that I really wanted to highlight here, and we'll include a study uh, below in the show notes that digs in this a little bit deeper, but there is good evidence that COVID infection can be a big trigger for mast cell activation syndrome, which my thinking there is... We're activating the body in a big way, our immune system with this infection. And then also we can see a lot of autoimmune conditions going a little haywire after COVID infection. And we've covered this in other videos, but I wanted to touch base with that and then also include that study below in our show notes. Another theory that I have, but the evidence that suggests this is well-founded, is patients that have had a major GI disruption, um, especially developing leaky gut, they might have been able to shoulder the burden of this histamine release in the past, but now since our barrier that is going to control how much of the outside world we are seeing from our GI tract uh, 
could cause a situation where now mast cell activation syndrome symptoms are really starting to become more prominent. And the way these mast cells work is once they're activated, that histamine release, all those chemical transmitters that are being circulating at this point can actually influence the mast cells to continue releasing more histamine. So if someone is starting out with kind of trying to address mast cell, if they have a formal diagnosis, if they're like, hey, I've got lots of allergies, and honestly, really anyone, I would encourage them to look into food sensitivity testing. So we sell a fantastic kit that'll actually look at leaky gut as well. So we'll include links to testing below, but uh, also wanted to highlight that, um, that if, if someone is coming to us trying to address mast cell symptoms, that's usually one of the first things that we will do because we want to fix that leaky gut and then also identify the foods that could be contributing to it and prevent it from reoccurring. Um, really astounding how many patients come with these symptoms and then we test their gut and go like, okay, this is exactly what we thought we were going to see. So that concludes our discussion of pertinent labs that can be drawn, uh, genetics involved in MCAS, and other disorders that could result in developing symptomology, such as COVID or um, infections of other varieties or leaky gut, as we discussed. The third criteria for diagnosis, and th this might seem a little obvious, but if we start using agents or making interventions that are going to be, be helping to stabilize those mast cells or block histamine effects on their downstream targets and the symptoms associated with MKS improve, that would be an indication that you might have mast cell activation syndrome, um, which is a good segue to our next video that we're going to cover. We're going to look at a lot of dietary changes. A lot of food can actually be high in histamine, so ways to address histamine burden through that. Uh, changing the gut microbiome is going to have a big effect on histamine. Um, we can also talk about supplements that are going to be stabilizing those mast cells and, of course, uh, prescription medication interventions. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, if you have any questions or want me to dig in to detail further on anything that we covered today, uh, feel free to comment below. We always look at those comments and then either adapt our videos or address them directly. Uh, thank you again and have a wonderful day.